Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Columbus Bible Church live stream question and answer session. We appreciate you joining with us here tonight. Um, I do have some important news about the studio audience. Um, we've had a decline in the studio audience, and uh, the reason why is Abby went to spend some time with Grandma and Grandpa. So uh, studio audience is a little bit down, so we have open spots, um, but we're, we're working on that. So um, thank you for joining us tonight. Let me open us in a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Father God, thank you for this time. We thank you that we can fellowship around your word. We pray that the time would be used profitably and that you would be glorified in the time we spend together. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Our first question tonight is a, a really terrific question. It's one that's highly important. The question is this. How should a father today share the gospel with his small children with the intention of them believing the gospel and getting saved? And how do you know for sure when they are saved? Great question. How does a parent share the gospel with their children to get the children saved? And how do you know if and when they are? So get with me 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So what is it that is able to make someone wise unto salvation? The scriptures are. And of course, we know that Timothy uh, was raised under the influence of the scriptures because uh, he, had, he had ancestors that were believing. So the, the first thing that we notice from this is that the best thing that you can do for children is you can raise them under the influence of the gospel. If you think about that, that would be things like uh, have them attend a church where the gospel is regularly preached. Have them regularly be involved in Sunday school. Have them be involved in Bible curriculum. Have them hear you read the Bible to them. You can tell them Bible stories. But the, the key thing from 2 Timothy 3.15 is the way that someone is made wise unto salvation is through the scriptures. Now, let me just make an observation and uh, parents in the audience, I'm curious if you find this to be true. But it's a general thing that parents are sometimes surprised at what their children know. The children will say something or they'll answer a question and the parent realizes, wow, they understood that. Or wow, they heard that conversation. Or wow, they remember that. And oftentimes what happens is, if you ask the child, well, how do you know that? And they'll tell you an event or a circumstance that they recall. I've had this experience. I reflect on that circumstance. I don't remember what they're describing. And my thought was, well, they weren't paying attention. They were goofing around. I'm surprised they remember anything. But what often happens is children do perceive things. I'm looking at some of the studio audience, and the studio audience thinks that's the story of their life. Um, that what happens is they will seem to be distracted. They will seem to not be paying attention, and there will be things that they pick up, that they perceive, that they understand and remember. Now, there's times where they don't, but what I'm getting at is there's a lot of times where they do. Well, if you, under, if you recognize there are many times that they do, then the answer is obvious. Have them under the preaching of the gospel again and again and again and again. And even if they forget 75% of it, if they only remember 25% or 10%, if they hear it enough, it'll be ingrained in their memory. So the first thing to do as a parent is you want your children raised under the sound of the gospel regularly. Um, Get with me 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now let's consider this question. What is the, the age at which 
children should get saved? And what is the age at which they, they can get saved? Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So based upon that verse, when is the ideal time for a person to get saved? And the answer is now, immediately, without delay. Now think through this with me just for a moment. If you have an infant, if you have a young child that is under the age of accountability, then if that child dies, they're going to go to heaven whether they have faith or not because they're under the age of accountability. And that's just clearly the case. But what happens, I mean, think about this with me if you would. Every, every adult who has ever gone to hell was at one point under the age of accountability. You get that. Everyone is born, right? There's a time where everyone is born. There's a time where they are, according to Romans 7, spiritually alive. And then what happens is as they go through the maturation process of life, they come to a knowledge of good and evil and they become guilty. And they attain to a point where they are at the age of accountability. And at the age of accountability, if they don't believe the gospel, that means that they will go to hell when they die. So if that's true, that means every human being that is ever born has the potential to go to hell. Because if they live long enough and don't believe the gospel, where are they going to go? They're going to go to hell. So the, the prudent parent looks at that and says, what I need to do is I need to get my children to believe the gospel as early in life as possible. Now, when I say get to believe the gospel, I'm not saying you hit them in the head until they believe it. But what I'm saying is you expose them to the gospel again and again and again and again so that they, they, they understand it. They can recite it. They, they know what it is. Now, I want you to think about this with me just for a minute. Can an infant, can a one-month-old, can they believe the gospel? And my answer to that, some people will object to this, but my answer to that is no. The one-month-old can't believe the gospel because they can't intellectually comprehend it. Think about what the gospel is. Get 1 Corinthians 15. Get 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the gospel is that Christ died for our sins. Well, in order to believe the gospel, you have to understand what sin is. You have to understand that you're a sinner. You have to understand what sin is. Well, it's very clear from the Scriptures that, that little children are born without the knowledge of good and evil. When they're very young, they don't understand the difference between good and evil. They don't have that knowledge. Well, if they don't have that knowledge, they can't understand sin, and thus they can't get saved until they have enough comprehension to know good and evil and to know what sin is. So what you're trying to do is this. You're trying to expose your young child to the gospel again and again and again, so that as soon as they come to that understanding of good and evil, in other words, when they come to an understanding of, yeah, I do some things that are wrong. Yeah, sometimes I, I hit my siblings when I shouldn't, and sometimes I take their toys, and sometimes I don't listen to dad even though I should because he is an infallible, accurate authority on all things. And yet sometimes I don't listen to him, which is a gross, grievous, heinous sin that no one should commit, but they do because they have a sin nature. And so the importance of the, some people are laughing, I don't understand why, the importance of having them in continually exposed to the gospel so when they come to the point where they can believe it, they believe it right there. You don't want to delay it. If someone can understand the gospel at age four and get believe, and believe it and be saved, that's the best time. Now, praise the Lord, 
what happened, my wife was really good about this. She led our children to the Lord at a very young age. And, uh, you know, for right or wrong, here's the reality. They were sinners. They still are. And uh, they came to the knowledge of, yeah, I'm, I'm sinning and I'm doing things I shouldn't. And when they came to that knowledge, they came to, to guilt. And by sharing the gospel with them, they could believe and get saved. Now, I want to share with you something here that... Um, I think is a helpful tool. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about fair ministry. And what I mean by that is uh, one of the things that you should consider for your assembly is whether you have some sort of outreach to the public and you want you want to do things like that. I have a good friend uh, in, in Chicago, a number of good friends in Chicago, and they came up with a ministry that they do at the fair. And what they do is they'll get a booth and they'll go through quiz questions with children where they stop by and then here's what they do. It's sort of clever. Everyone likes wristbands, right? So you can get wristbands printed for like 15 cents or 20 cents. They're not expensive. And uh, what you do is you, you have a quiz or something at your booth that attracts people and you say, we'll give you a free wristband. And we have ones that are done here the way ours are done. They say Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. So you give the child a wristband, and they're happy to have it. And now what have you done? You've given them something that is a perpetual reminder of what the gospel is. What is the gospel? Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. So you give them a wristband that is a, a memorial of that. So seems like something that is, is worth doing. We've done that and benefited from it. Now what I'm going to show you here... People call this a, a gospel button or a gospel foldout. One of the things that we like to do, uh, and a good, another good friend of mine showed me this. See, is, here's the thing. You don't have to be smart in life, but if you have smart friends and they tell you what they know, then you can just do what they do. really good friend of mine showed me this. Um, so what this is, this is actually a picture of Disneyland, which I do not like, but I like the gospel button concept. So here's what it is. Let's say I'm talking to a small group of children and I'm trying to teach them the gospel, but I want to hold their attention. So I said, can I tell you a story? And if their parents tell you yes, then here's what you do. Well, God lives in heaven and he wants us to go to heaven. But there's a problem. We sin and because we sin, we're guilty and we can't go to heaven. But the good news is Christ died on the cross for our sins. He shed his blood to pay the penalty for our sins, and therefore we can have forgiveness and be clean. And if we do that, then we can go to heaven. And if you, you I'm sure you're shocked, but I actually did that without fumbling or dropping anything. But it's that simple. And, and the gospel is a simple thing. And so we should look for simple, clear ways to communicate it. And I hope what I've impressed upon you is child evangelism is a wonderful, terrific thing where what you can do is you can get a child at a young age before they've lived 70 years of a hardened, sinful life. When their heart is tender, you can tell them the gospel. They can believe it. And you're setting up their life where, number one, they're saved and they, they don't go to hell. But number two, they can now have a life of spiritual productivity for the Lord. So child evangelism is a, is a terrific thing. Now, the, the, question, the, the second part of this question was, how do you know if someone is saved? Well, you, truthfully, you never know if someone else is saved because you can't see inside their heart. But here's what I would recommend that you do, uh, not only with children, but you can do this with adults as well. What you can do after you present the gospel to someone or if you're just having a conversation about the gospel, is you can ask them questions. And the way that they answer the questions will tell you whether or not they're saved. One of the reasons we use a quiz format in, in our booth at the fair is when you give them the questions, how they answer the question reveals their understanding. So, for example, we have ours set up as true-false questions. So one of them is, to go to heaven, I have to do good works, true or false. A lot of people are going to put true on that. And when they, when, they, when they select true, they're telling you what they believe the gospel is. They're telling you they don't understand Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So if you, if you design the questions the right way, you can see where they misunderstand and you can know what you need to talk with them about. So I'll give you some questions that I think are helpful to use. And these are particularly good with, with little ones. What is sin? So you need to know what sin is because Christ died for our sins. 
Then make it personal. Are you a sinner? People need to understand that they're a sinner. That's why they need the gospel. Sometimes I would follow that up with, how do you know you are a sinner? And they'll typically tell you they do bad things. And so you can be comfortable once they tell you that, that they understand what sin is. A great question to ask people is, why did the Lord Jesus Christ die on the cross? You have to have an understanding of why he died on the cross to really understand what his death accomplished. Great question is, what do we need to do to go to heaven? Sometimes the way that we phrase that is, if you were to die today and God were to say, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? That's one of my favorite questions for adults because it tells you what they're trusting in. And so many times people will say, I've been water baptized. I already have a church. I'm basically a good person. They give you all sorts of things that are essentially their resume. Here's the good things about me. And when they tell you those things, they're telling you they don't understand the gospel. And so it allows you to then present the gospel and take them to the verses that they need to hear. Another good question is, are you going to heaven? How do you know? So the beauty of this is many times you will present information to someone and they'll nod or they'll act like they understand, but you can't really tell. So if you ask them the question and you're essentially forcing them to articulate in their own words what they believe, you'll figure out whether they understand it or not. Now, it's just my opinion, but you know what you often do with children? How do they learn the multiplication tables? Well, you have flashcards, right? What's nine times seven? What's seven times nine? What's eight times eight? And you go through them again and again and again and again. And you're doing that because you want them to know the information perfectly. Well, the same thing you should do with your children is you should have them memorize Ephesians 2, 8, 9 so they can recite it to you. You should have them memorize 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. You should have them memorize... Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They should have those verses in their thinking, and you should ask them again and again and again, what is the gospel? And you just keep doing it till they absolutely, utterly know the answer. So the best confirmation of whether or not someone is saved is when they can tell you the gospel. Because when they can tell you the gospel, it means that they have understood it. So I appreciate the listener sending in that question. Um, evangelism is, is just one of the, if not the, most critically important activities of believers. Evangelizing children is one of the wisest things that we can do. So appreciate the question. Next question. Is Hebrews 10.25 transdispensational. Hebrews 10.25, is it transdispensational? So get with me Hebrews 10.25. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Hebrews 10.25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now, one of the common uses of Hebrews 10.25 is what preachers will do. When, when, they're, they're, when they're congregational members, when they don't attend enough, Hebrews 10.25 is a great verse, right? In other words, what you do is you say, Hebrews 10.25, Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembling of, of ourselves together. So some of you are you're violating that verse. Now, just so you understand, look at me at Hebrews 10, 26, Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. What preachers often do with Hebrews 10, 25 is they like what Hebrews 10, 25 says. So they grab Hebrews 10, 25 and they preach it at people. But in some ways, that's sort of a it's, it's a questionable thing to do. And the reason why it's a questionable thing to do is, is, is a couple. He Hebrews is written for ages to come. It's not written for people during the dispensation of grace. Hebrews, as the name of the book implies, is written to 
Hebrews. It's not written to the body of Christ. It's not written to people during the dispensation of grace. If you grab Hebrews 10.25 and you say, that verse is for me, that verse is for us today, well, what about Hebrews 10.26? Because Hebrews 10.26 is not for us today. And it's, it's, it's a questionable practice to grab Hebrews 10.25 and yet not grab Hebrews 10.26. So, now, by the way, just to be clear, Hebrews 10.25, it, it's written at a different point in time, but the concept may be appropriate during the dispensation of grace. So that's what we're going to look at. So the question is, is Hebrews 10.25 trans-dispensational, realizing that it's not written for us to, to us today, it's written over here. Nonetheless, is it truth that we should apply today? Um, and so let me show you something. Maybe you've seen someone do this. I don't know. Uh, but let's look with me at, get with me, uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to run a search on the word hell, okay? And we have a small technical problem here. Just one sec. Just one sec. We appreciate your patience. Let's get this going here. Well, so I'm going to talk you through what I'm doing. Uh, we're going to run a search on the word hell, and then what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what Paul has to say about it. And so let's, we have Blue Letter Bible up here. We've run our search on hell. Sorry for the technical problem. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to restrict this to the Pauline epistles, okay? So notice with me what's happened. I've run a search on the word hell. <laughs> what is going on? What is going on? Um, all right, we're going to move on. We may not be lose, using Blue Letter Bible tonight. Apologies, apologies, I don't know why that is. Um, so here's what will happen. If you're following along at home, you can do this yourself, and I would encourage you to. When you run the word hell in Paul's epistles, what happens is, here we go. Ta-da. So if you need IT consulting, if you have tech problems, do not call me. It is just not going to be your answer. But notice something here. I've run the word hell. I've done it in the Pauline epistles, and it occurs zero times in zero verses. I've seen people write things where they say, hell is not a Pauline concept. Hell does not apply during the dispensation of grace. I'll prove it. Paul never uses the word hell. Now, is that logic sound? Here's the answer. It is a true statement that Paul never uses the word hell, but it is a false statement to say that Paul doesn't teach about hell. You follow me? I'm going to say that one more time. Paul never uses the word hell. So if someone says the statement, Paul doesn't use the word hell, that is a true statement. But it is a completely false statement to say Paul never teaches about hell. And I'll prove that to you. Get with me 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting, everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So someone says, Paul never says anything, never uses the word hell. Yeah, that's true, but he talks about flaming fire taking vengeance and punished with everlasting destruction. What do you think that is, right? I mean, that's hell. Here's what I'm getting at. 
when you see a verse like not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, Paul doesn't use that exact phrasing. He doesn't. Don't leap to the conclusion, though, that therefore that concept is inapplicable or something that Paul denies. Just as he doesn't use the word hell, but he talks about it, Paul has some things to say about whether or not believers should assemble themselves together. So that's what we're going to look at. Now let me just say this at the beginning. Church attendance has nothing to do with salvation. If you quit going to church, it's not going to affect your salvation. I'm not saying it will. It doesn't. So let's just be clear on that. I will say this. Church attendance is highly relevant, perhaps indispensable, to the quality of your spiritual life. So if you're a believer and you quit going to church, is it going to affect your salvation? No. Is it going to affect your spiritual life? Yeah, it will. So let me give you what I consider the typical progression of a grace believer's life. This is my opinion. You can disagree with it. I'm just going to give you my opinion. What happens within Christendom is there's many, many, many churched people. And what I mean by that is when you say someone is churched, it means they have a place they regularly attend. They may be saved, they may not be saved, it's hard to tell. You can't visibly tell whether someone is saved necessarily, but you can tell whether or not they're churched by whether or not they attend a church. So what happens is the world has many churched people where they attend somewhere. But what will happen is they'll come along and they'll learn right division. And when they learn right division, what often happens is they get really excited about it. And they'll want to study a lot. And they'll, they'll want to hear more and more teaching. And they'll faithfully attend because what happens is they feel as if the blinders have fallen and now they have clarity. And so they'll be really excited about right division. Now, here's my observation. You can decide whether or not this is true. I think I've seen this. Um, spent a lot of time preaching and teaching, and I think I've observed this. One of the things that happens is when a person first comes to right division, one of the things that they grapple with is people grapple with the question of eternal security. And they grapple with the question of eternal security for the following basic reason. And I'm going to just pull up the chart here so we can look at it together. The typical non-dispensationalist will take all of the scripture as being meaningful for him. So when I was first saved, someone said to me, and they meant well, the Bible is God's love letters to man. And since the Bible is God's love letters to man, it's all for you. Just pick anywhere you like because it's all to you. And that sounded like a nice notion. And many people just believe that. So what happens is they'll read the book of Matthew and they'll think that the instructions in Matthew explain how salvation works today. They'll read verses in Hebrews that seem to talk about people falling away and they'll wonder if they can lose their salvation. And there's verses in Paul that say different things, but Boy, there's some verses in Matthew about enduring unto the end. And there's verses in Hebrews about people drawing back under perdition. And so the typical, I'll say reasonably educated, churched person comes across those verses. And they have in the back of their mind, I don't know. I think it's eternal security because of verses that say that. But then what does Hebrews really mean? And what does Matthew really mean? And so what I would suggest to you is the typical church person, even if they believe eternal security, they have doubts because the only way to truly be confident in eternal security is you have to rightly divide. Once you rightly divide and you realize that Paul's writings are intentionally distinct from the Gospels, intentionally distinct from the Hebrew epistles, it all fits together perfectly. So here's what happens. This is my opinion. You can decide. What happens often with believers is 
when they come into the knowledge of right division, after a little bit of time in right division, they get a hold of eternal security in a powerful way. Because what happens is those verses in Hebrews and James and Matthew no longer bother them. They used to bother them. And so let me tell you the way that I think human nature works. When you have in the back of your mind, you know, maybe I can lose my salvation, you know what you do? You give a little bit more. You attend a little bit more. You're a little bit more intentional. You're a little bit more fearful about your service because you have this nagging doubt. I might just lose it. I could do that. When you come into right division, all those doubts disappear and you get a really good hold on eternal security. And this is just my opinion. When some people get a really good hold on eternal security, they give less, they pray less, they attend less for the very simple reason they realize they can and it won't affect their salvation. That's what happens with a lot of believers. I think I've seen that. You can decide whether or not you think that's true. But one of the realities of teaching people grace is you're going to give them absolute clarity. You're going to give them absolute confidence in their salvation. And when they get that, sometimes the attitude is, that is awesome. I am confident. I am assured. And now I'm going to chill. That's just that's how human nature works. So here's what I would then suggest happens. Here's how people decide whether they attend church. This is my opinion. They attend church when they feel like it. They attend church if they think they're going to get a benefit. Sometimes they feel like, you know what, I'm just, I just feel like sleeping in. Sometimes they feel like, you know what, um, big game on today. I want to get ready for the game, want to get my nachos set, want to get all my food ready so I can watch the game. And so I'm skipping today because I want to watch the game. And what people do, this is my opinion, is they make their own personal cost-benefit analysis. How much am I going to enjoy going to church? You know, I got to get up, I got to get dressed, I got to drive there. And, you know, I'll probably get something out of it, maybe. Um, but, you know, maybe I'll just skip because... You know, just, you know, I'd rather skip. Another thing I think I've observed, you can decide for yourself. Another thing I think that I have deserved, uh, observed is, uh, is that uh, people go to church when they need it. And I'll give you an example of what happens. People will go through a rough spot in life. And what happens is they're sort of beaten down, so they go to church and they'll go to church until they get their batteries spiritually recharged. And so they go to church, they, get, they, get, they spiritually benefit, they get back into a good place. And when they're back into a good place, you know what they do? I'm all good. Uh, now I can go back to doing what I want to do. And, and what it's like is it's sort of like the auto repair shop, right? In other words, you don't... Um, you don't go to the auto repair shop unless the car's broken. If the car's doing okay, I mean, it may not be perfect, but if the car's doing okay, then uh, you don't need to go to the auto repair shop. And people view church in the sense of, in, in the sense of, uh, well, I'll go when, when I need it, but for now, I'm good. And by the way, you guys are, are blowing up the comments here. Um, so I got a couple here. I'd rather stay home than go to a church that doesn't teach right division. I can understand that. And, and I, just to be clear, I'm not saying you should attend a church that preaches false doctrine. Um, I'm not saying that. Um, but um, what, what, you should, what you should think through is how do you support a church that teaches right doctrine? Um, because that's really sort of the question in my mind. Um, so let me ask you a, a couple of questions just to think about. If you don't attend church, how do you minister to the body of Christ? And um, 
for what it's worth, I think what happens is when people think about the question of going to church, they don't really think about the issue of, I'm going to go there because there's people there I need to minister to, I need to encourage. They think about it from the standpoint of, what am I going to benefit from it? Uh, give me 1 Corinthians 5. And my purpose in sharing all this stuff with you is I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on you. I'm not trying to make decisions for your life. You make decisions for your life. Um, what I'm trying to share with you is you know, my observations of what I think I've witnessed over the years. You can decide uh, whether or not you think that's true. Get 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, what's 1 Corinthians 5 talking about? Well, there's obviously a believer that's engaged in, in grievous sin, right? It's, it's, it's bad. It's really bad. And so what does Paul say should be done? What he, what he says should be done is he says, put them out of the assembly. And when he says, put them out of the assembly, what that's actually doing is delivering them unto Satan. Now, ponder that verse, if you will. It's not physically delivering him to Satan and that Satan has an address and he receives a package. That's not what it is. But what, what's being said in 1 Corinthians 5 is this. Satan, as the god of this world, has such great influence over the thinking of the world that when you expel someone from the doctrinal protective teaching of the church, what you're doing is you're, you're placing them in the, the dominion of, of Satan. You're, you're, you're placing him into the dominion of Satan because what you're doing is it, it's, it, he's going to come under the influence of the world and not have the benefit of the teaching of the church. So think about this with me for a minute. In 1 Corinthians 5, when Paul says to put that offender out of the assembly, the purpose of that is for that person to repent of their behavior and come back to the assembly. It, it's, it's a form of chastisement there. Well, what happens when people voluntarily quit going to church? They are essentially delivering themselves unto Satan based upon that verse. So another good question here, what do you do when there is no right division church near you? I would love to find a church that I can attend. I hear you. Um, the short answer is sometimes there is no easy answer for that. And I will tell you that the other relevant consideration is sometimes you have to be the answer for your own prayers. So what I mean by that is this. You may be a grace believer in a location where there isn't a right division church. And you know what that means? Praise the Lord. You now have an opportunity. You can now start something. And what happens many times is people say, well, I, I can't, I'm not called, I'm not equipped to do that. My encouragement to you is to purpose in your heart to become equipped. You may come to right division, and the moment you come to right division, I agree, you're, you're not ready to lead something because you're going to need to have to get established in the faith. But what you can do is you can purpose and you can grow and you can come to an understanding where you can then teach others take this for what it's worth. Um, we've, we've been blessed to be in this situation where we have seen people in assemblies that we were a part of relocate for various reasons. And when they relocate, some of those folks were really sound in the faith. They were established. And so they relocated to a new area and they were able to then establish a ministry or to assist in one because they had gotten established. So the first priority, just as you think through life, of course, the first priority is get saved. We know that. What do you have to get saved? According to 1 Timothy 2, you come to a knowledge of the truth. In other words, you come to a knowledge of the truth so that you are established in your faith 
And then once you've done that, you're now in a position where you can minister to others. One of the things we've done, you know, one of the reasons we spent all the time in Blue Letter Bible is we want to show you these tools. We want to give you these techniques because they can help you grow, help you be equipped. So let's go back to our friend Blue Letter Bible just for a minute here. And I'm now going to run a new search, and the search I'm going to run is member. So we're going to run the search of member in Paul's epistles, and we're going to just look at what Paul has to say about it. So notice this with me. We're looking at member in Paul's epistles. For the body is not one member, but many. And if they were all one member, where were the body? And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. And I'm going to skip a couple verses where it's using members differently. Romans 12, 4, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Now we'll keep reading here, but you've noticed a theme by now, and that's this. If you're a saved person today, you are a member of the body of Christ. The body of Christ consists of multiple members. So think of, of your physical body for a minute with me. You know from the Psalms that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have fingers, which are wonderful, and you have a hand, and so you can do things like clap, like you're enjoying this teaching so much that some of you at home are like... Kudos, kudos, this is so tremendous. Or maybe you're doing a, I don't know what you're doing. But the point is that God has equipped your body that has all of these wonderful parts so that you can walk and run and play the piano and type and do all these things. Well, what happens when you start to lose body parts? Well, the body doesn't function as well, right? If you lose your bottom, you don't have anywhere to sit. So you need your bottom. Right? And you need your feet to walk, and you need fingers to point and say, knock it off. Right? You need the parts of your body. So what happens when members of the body of Christ decide, I don't need to be a part of the body. I can just, I can just get my information at home, right? I can just get on YouTube. I don't need to be a part of a physical body. Well, think how your physical body would happen if your toes just said, we're leaving. What would happen if your elbow said, I'm out of here? Things just wouldn't work properly. You, you get the point. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 2. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20, But now are they many members, yet but one body. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are what? Necessary. Is there any part of the body of Christ that is not necessary? And the answer is no. We're all necessary. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular, Ephesians 4.25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another, and so on. I'm not going to continue to read more members' verses, but you see the point. So the way God designed the body of Christ, just understand this. The church during the dispensation of grace is described as the body of Christ. It's described as the body of Christ, and the metaphor that's used again and again and again and again is that the individual saints, the individual believers, are members of the body of Christ. Well, the way a body functions properly is it has to have all the parts together. So it is critically important for the assembly that you're part of for you to be there. That's how the assembly is going to function the best. So, oh, I'm sorry? All right, so now we're going to run a different search. And what I'm going to run here is I'm going to run the search together. 
And so I'm going to run the search together and then I'm going to limit it to the times where it appears in Paul because we can, you'll see some things once we, um, once we see what the together verses have to say. So give it just one sec here. I'm going to restrict this to the Pauline epistles and run the search, and we'll go through several of these verses. All right, so look with me at Romans, uh, uh, Romans 1, verse 12, and I'm actually going to, I'm going to skip down to 1 Corinthians 12 just for the sake of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 24. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together. The body functions well when it functions together. And there's some verses in Ephesians. I'm going to just go to those. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2.21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Ephesians 4.16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. See, there's a function for everyone within the body of Christ. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself, in love. Get with me Philippians 1 verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. You see how it talks about with one mind striving together? You'll never experience better teamwork. You'll never experience a more joyful fellow laboring than you will when you labor together with other members of the body of Christ. Philippians 3.17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. And then Colossians 2.19, And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministereth, and knit together. So you can see let me just recap this quickly. When we looked at members, it's clear that saints are members of the body of Christ and were designed to function together because a body needs its members. When we looked at the together verses, those together verses talk about the saints acting together, being together in the body of Christ. Now, the next search I want to run, this one was the first time I ever did this many years ago. This church profoundly affected how I think about fellowship. And so let's run it together. So what I've run here is I've run fellow with the wild card, and we're going to look at every time the word fellow appears in Paul's epistles. Now, as, as preface to that, let me talk about fellowship. In common parlance, when we use the word fellowship, what we often mean is this. We're going to get together for church after church for fellowship. And what that means is we're going to sit down together and eat and talk. And that's fine. I like fried chicken as well as about anyone, I suppose. I'm not against that. I'm in favor of that. But I think it's helpful to understand what scriptural fellowship is. And so what we're going to do with the word fellow here is we're going to focus on every time that Paul uses it and notice with me if there's a pattern as to how Paul uses the word fellow. So we'll, we'll go through these one by one. The key thing that you're going to notice, and I'll just tell you so you can watch for it as we go through the verses, is that Paul uses the word fellow frequently as a prefix, and then he adds another noun right after it. So let's look at some of these together. So we're going to start in Romans 16, verse 7. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. 
In 1 Corinthians 1, 9, Paul uses the word fellowship. In 1 Corinthians 10, 20, he uses the word fellowship. In 2 Corinthians 6, he uses the word fellowship and so on. Let's go down to 2 Corinthians 8, 23. Fellow helper. Now, the first, the first compound word we saw, if you remember, was fellow prisoner. The next word is fellow helper. In Ephesians 2, 8, 219, Paul uses the word fellow citizens. Ephesians 3, 6, fellow heirs. Philippians 2, 25, fellow soldier. Philippians 4, 3, fellow laborer. Colossians 1, 7, fellow servant. Colossians 4, 7, fellow servant. Colossians 4, 10, fellow prisoner. Colossians 4, 11, fellow worker. 1 Thessalonians 3, 2, fellow laborer. Philemon, fellow laborer. Philemon, fellow soldier, fellow prisoner, fellow laborer. Now, I hope what you notice with that is when the word fellow is used, it's so frequently used with fellow laborer, fellow servant, fellow helper, fellow prisoner. In other words, here's what it is not. I don't know if you ever think about all the people that like let's say, the same football team. They're a group of fans. And what they have in common is they have in common a love for that team. That's what they have in common. If you think of, oh, I don't know, sometimes there's science fiction book clubs. And what happens is those people like science fiction books, or maybe there's a model rocketry club. In other words, there's a lot of human organizations where what happens is people get together around a common interest. What I would tell you scriptural fellowship is, is the deepest fellowship you can have with someone is when you labor together with them in the gospel. So what's happening right now with the pandemic situation, a lot of people are dealing with the fact that you're sort of stay at home. Many have a lot less human interaction than they did before, and a lot of people are looking for human connections, and it's perfectly natural to do that. And what the world offers in terms of human collections is they, c connections is it's, it's, it's fan clubs. It's things where people share the same interest but those interests are, are temporal. They're not, they're not really meaningful. Well, here's what I would suggest to you. The way that you really feel a part of the body of Christ, the way that you truly experience fellowship with other believers is you work together with them. And so when you work together in the assembly and you work together on something for the cause of Christ, you connect with people in a way that is much deeper than anything else on earth. So when people don't have the blessing of being part of a local assembly, that's something that they miss. So let me ask you another question. And these are just things for thought. If you don't attend an assembly, how do you minister to the body of Christ? And what I mean by that is this, when you attend church, you should think about it from the standpoint of, are there people there today that I can encourage? Is there someone that needs to be said hi to? Is there someone whose spirit needs to be lifted? I mean, think about this with me just for a moment. What happens during the week? Well, you go, you go through your normal week and what do you have? Well, you may have problems at work. You may have problems with the car. Now we got problems with the pandemic. You just face troubles in this life. Is it easy for people on this planet to be discouraged? Yeah, it is, because the planet's been cursed by sin. So one of the things, one of the reasons you should attend church is there's members of the body of Christ there that you can minister, that you can encourage to. And it seems to me that's the way to think about it. Another thing I would suggest that you think about is, how do you know how to be a help to the ministry if you don't know what the needs are. One of the ways that you figure out how to help your church is if you're there regularly and you see it and you think, 
wait a minute, we need this done. This needs to be cleaned. We need a ministry to help these people. We need someone to, to greet people and be an encourager. You're not going to perceive those needs unless you're physically present so you can observe them. So that's another reason why you need to be there. Um, I'll share this with you just as an observation. One of the things that happens is sometimes people will, will say to the preacher, you never preach on this topic. And sometimes what happens is when people say that to you, you know you taught on that topic two months ago, but people just weren't there. So don't take this. What I'm saying is this, and I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on anyone. I'm not trying to condemn anyone. But what I'm, what I'm saying is this. Hebrews 10.25 is not phraseology that Paul repeats. He, he doesn't. But he tells you that one of the privileges you have as a saint is you're a member of the body of Christ. And the body doesn't function when its members are missing. It just doesn't. When, when, the, when members are absent, the body feels different. It is different. We looked at the verses about together. God designed the body of Christ to function together. And so that's how we need to operate. If you want to have true fellowship, what do you do? Well, then you're not just a spectator, but you figure out how can I work in this? How can I be a, a helper? How can I be a, a, a laborer for the truth? And so I would encourage those of you that have grace assemblies that you can attend to be part of them and to figure out how you can be there regularly and how you can encourage the preacher and how you can, can help with things and, and, and just be an active part of the life of the assembly. Now, some of you, and I can tell by the question, some of you don't have a local grace church, so what do you do? And that, that's not an easy question. But what I would encourage you about is I would encourage you about this. I'd encourage you to operate according to the rule of necessity. And, and what I mean by that is this. If you're in an area where there is no Grace Church, that means there needs to be one. And what that means is you have an opportunity to be the solution. You have an opportunity to be the one that starts the Bible study there that says, you know what we're going to do? Maybe we, we don't have a church building yet, but we're going to have a Bible study and we're going to study right division together. Or we're going to study some preacher. We're going to watch their videos and then talk about them together. We're going to start somewhere and we're going to do something. You don't have to have you don't have to have everything solved day one. What you need to do is you need to have a purpose. You need to have a purpose and say, we're going to be the answer to this problem. We may help other people do that, but we're going to do our thing. And again, again, please let me be clear. I'm not trying to put guilt on you. I'm not trying to, some of you are in situations where there may be, there may not be a church that you could properly support. So then what you have to do is just think about what you can do. And I would say always what we need to be doing is we always need to be growing in grace. We always need to be getting better established so that we can do the work of the ministry. So I know I spent a lot of time on that question. Appreciate your spending time with us. Um, take this, please, as a word of encouragement, not a word of condemnation. Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians that he didn't want to have dominion over their faith, but he wanted to be helpers of their joy. And, and that's, that's our desire. Let's close together in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for these saints. We thank you for their interest in the truth. We thank you for their willingness to, uh, to study and their willingness to consider these things. We pray, Lord, that for all the saints, you would give us opportunities, doors of utterance during this time. We know people are fearful. We know that, uh, that they're concerned, that they have, they have fears and doubts. Help us, Lord, to minister to them. Help us to communicate the assurance and the peace and the confidence they can have in the Lord Jesus Christ based upon what he's done for us. It's in his holy name that we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.